Hey guys, welcome to Swerve Church. So as you know, we've been working our way through the series called The Chosen, where we've been looking at the people that Jesus encountered and Jesus interacted with and that Jesus ultimately invited to do ministry with and, and shared his life and, and, and shared about the kingdom of God and healed and, and provided for. And we've been following them and we've been tracking along in this journey with, uh, with the show called The Chosen. It's a show that you can actually stream uh, absolutely free. Uh, and we've been kind of showing you some scenes and uh, been explaining to you where the creators take a little bit of creative freedom to kind of give us a glimpse at what some of these interactions might have been um, like. And, and we've been looking at some of the people that Jesus chose who were outcasts and they were lowly and humble people. They were oftentimes the rejected people in society, yet Jesus showed favor to them. Jesus showed grace and mercy, and he loved them. The first week we spoke about Mary, who was tormented by demons, and nobody would want to come close to her. However, Jesus showed compassion and healed her from that torment. We spoke about the children, right? The little children. And in a world where oftentimes children are viewed as bothersome and cumbersome and as a, as a bother, Jesus loved and cherished children, invested in children. We spoke about that. We, last week we spoke about Peter, right? We looked at Peter, this ordinary, untrained fisherman who would have been overlooked by anybody else, but Jesus loved and Jesus saw potential and Jesus invited and told Peter, come and follow me. This week we're going to be looking at a story of a man who had a highly contagious disease. Uh, but first I wanted to ask you guys a question. What is the grossest, nastiest, yuckiest thing you've ever seen in your life? What was it like the most gross thing you've ever seen in your life? You know, the other day we were walking down Stanhope Street uh, right here by the church, walking home, and I saw this decaying rat. I mean, this thing was disgusting. It was flies all over, its guts split it all, uh, you know, splattered all over the place. Uh, I, I kid you not, it was bigger than a chihuahua, okay? It was so nasty. It was, it was so gross. It was disgusting. What about this? What's the smelliest thing that you've ever smelled? What's the smelliest thing that you've ever uh, smelled? You know, uh, I'll, I'll be embarrassed to, to kind of say this, but one, one time we were looking for this putrid smell that was coming uh, from the kitchen. It was disgusting. I didn't know what it was. Was it dirty pots? Was it rotting food? Uh, but, you know, I, I knew what that smell was, and it was the smell of a decaying, nasty mouse. And, uh, but we couldn't find it anywhere. We just we looked everywhere. We couldn't see it. And so I had to, like a bloodhound, sniff my way to where this nasty mouse uh, was and ugh, finally uh, found it, right? And, and it's so disgusting. Uh, and you guys know how that is. You know, whatever gross smell you're thinking of right now, it's so disgusting, it'll, it'll induce or activate your gag uh, reflex, right? You know, when you come across something gross and disgusting and, and something so nasty, like those things I just described, you don't approach it. You don't, you don't gravitate towards, you know, that gross nastiness. You, you're not poking at it with a stick. You're not playing with it. You don't pick up a dead rat and hold it up to see how it smells. You walk away from it, right? You, you avoid it at all costs. You, you run away. You ignore it. You let somebody else deal with it because you're not dealing with that nastiness, right? But let's be honest for a second because sometimes I believe we have a similar reaction um, when it comes to certain people, right? Sometimes, sometimes we have this kind of reaction to people that we encounter in the street. And, and honestly, sometimes maybe it, it is for good reason. We are in New York City and you do come across some dangerous people at times. And so sometimes it is for good reason, but sometimes, sometimes it's our own prejudices, isn't it? You know, sometimes we just avoid a person or we, we prefer to walk around a person or we cross the street or we plug our nose, right, to avoid smelling. We change train cars when that person or those people come in and we speed up our pace when we walk in the street. You know, for example, uh, you know, this week we were walking to the church, Melissa and I, and, uh, and there was actually um, some cops that were redirecting people because there's this, this homeless guy that is always on, on our block at, at home. He's always around. And apparently, he, I don't know what was going on, but he was doing something, I, I suppose, inappropriate and such. And so, the, you know, there was a couple female cops and they were actually redirecting just the pedestrians to cross the street, to not even cross paths with this guy. 
You know, I share this not, not to judge you, but to draw some similarities between our reaction to what's revolting or stomach churning or putrid, right? And just kind of draw out that connection because, um, you know, so there, there would be a similar reaction for a certain people group uh, and a certain particular group that we're going to be studying today. People would have that type of experience, that type of revolting stomach churning experience. Uh, because in the Bible, it talks about uh, a group of people that had uh, such a contagious disease, such a, a smelly and, 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 and quite honestly, a very difficult uh, to look at type of a disease. And when, whenever people would encounter this group of people, people would avoid them. They would run away from them. And at all costs, they would ignore and reject this group of people. They had you know, that same of future reaction that you might have to something gross. They would have it to this group of people. Who were these people? Well, they were the lepers. And they had a disease called leprosy. And this disease was a disease that ultimately would, would consume the flesh of the person and it would leave open wounds and it would be a very smelly disease and extremely uh, contagious. Uh, well, and, and today we're going to be looking at a, a passage where Jesus actually interacts with one of these people. And I, I want to show you what it says in Luke chapter 5, verse 12. It says, while he was in one of the towns, that's Jesus, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. And he saw Jesus and look at his reaction. He says, it fell face down and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, this is a, a very significant interaction here between this leper and between Jesus. If you guys look at the passage carefully there, it says it, that he had leprosy all over him and signifying to us the severity of the disease, how grave this person had the disease. It was all over his body. That means it was, it was very visible. It was very noticeable. And this was a big problem because in Jesus' day, especially number one, you can write this down, lepers were unclean. This was the perception that was giving to this suffering people. This was the perception that people had of them, that they were unclean. If you came across one, you would run away. You would avoid. You, you wouldn't even make eye contact with someone who had this debilitating disease. You would be nowhere close to them. And so the creators of the show, they, they give us a look at how an interaction with a diseased person like this might have been. So I wanted to show you guys a clip just to give you a, a behind the curtain, kind of behind the scenes look at what an interaction with someone with leprosy might have been. Check this out. She was crazy. Just because I run a charity does not mean I have to buy rocks from every old lady. Charity? Just like everything Roman, it's part of business. We loan proceeds seized from criminals to the poor. And others, you're passing through. I do not recall seeing you before. I come from Tyr. The mallet is carved of maple from Sidon. The chisels are bronze. The trowel is tin from Phoenician North. Hmm. My, my. Why would anyone want to part with these? I'm on my way to the Dead Sea. Shalom, pilgrim. Lucky me. I do not often see items of such quality. If only they were not brought in by some stranger passing through. They weren't stolen, if that's what you're saying. I can justify 20 denarii. You're joking, that's a fraction of what they're worth. Huh. Hades and sticks, I beg you. Leper, you are marked! You couldn't just die, you had to take us all to hell! We're forbidden within four cubits! Take it and go! I didn't mean you. Any harm. My tools were all I had left. You know, in Jesus' day, this disease was not only a physical ailment. It wasn't only something that the person suffered with physically, but it also became a spiritual ailment as well. You see, the perception was for a person that had such a disease, it must have been a punishment from God. I mean, he must have been a tremendous sinner. His, his family, you know, his parents must have been in sin and God is punishing him for the disease that he had. And so the perception was not only were they, you know, uh, not, 
not, not, not wanting to stick around them, not be around them, to avoid them at all costs. But then on top of that, there was the perception that spiritually they deserved it. And it was a punishment. And we read this from the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 13. In the Old Testament, it lines out a couple rules and regulations that were in place, in particular to people who had this disease. We read in chapter 13, verse 45, Leviticus. It says, the person who has a case of serious skin disease is to have his clothes torn and his hair hanging loose, and he must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. Can you guys imagine the embarrassment of having to yell out your condition to everybody that you encountered? Of not only do you have this debilitating disease, this very contagious disease, but now you have to go around telling everybody the disease that you have. Yelling out, I am unclean. I am unclean. Right? If you have a disease, if you have an ailment, if, you have something, if something's wrong with you, you don't announce it, right? You keep it private. But for a person who had this disease, they had to announce it. And, and, and not only was leprosy visible to everybody on the outside, you can clearly see it on their skin and on their bodies, but they also had to verbalize it. Can you guys imagine how demoralizing this must have been to the person with the disease. It's very demoralizing. It's an attack, it was an attack on the dignity and the personhood of the person that had it. You know, but not only that, number two, lepers lived isolated. Lepers lived isolated. Not only were they unclean, but because they were unclean, they couldn't have any type of human interaction. You see, because the disease was very contagious. And so if you spend any amount of time the chances were that you too can also get sick and they can spread the sickness. And so now, now we don't only have a physical condition that is contagious, but it was also a spiritual condition that was contagious as well. You see, if you came close, then the spiritual condition, this is the perception, can also spread. Not only could you spread the physical disease, but because they were unclean, ceremonially unclean and spiritually unclean, if you came into close contact and if you encountered or touched a person with this disease, you also became spiritually unclean. In other words, it was uncleanliness that would spread to something that was clean. A dirty thing would make a clean thing dirty. There were many rules in the Old Testament to maintain ceremonial purity. And if you broke the rule, you were unclean. You were ceremonially impure and you were unable to participate in spiritual things. In fact, we read this also in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46. It says, He will remain, talking about the person that has this disease, he will remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. Now guys, isn't that, isn't that like the saddest verse in the whole Bible? This person with the disease had to live alone outside of the camp, away from family, away from friends, away from the church community. You know, we say this all the time that we weren't designed to do life alone. God made us with a need for community. And, 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 and so we say this all the time. And, and by the way, that's why right now we're currently in our semester of life groups because you were meant to do life alone. And life groups provides a little bit of space for us to be able to come together, to be in each other's lives, to break bread together, to learn a little bit more about each other and to share what we're learning from God's word and just to participate in a little bit of community it gives us that space. And that's why it's so important. That's why I invite you this Wednesday at 7 p.m. to come and join us at Swerve Church for Life Group. We were designed for community. We were designed for human interactions. You were designed for hugs and handshakes and fist bumps. We were, we were designed for face to face. That's the way God designed us. And all of that was eliminated for the leper. He did not have access to any of that. And so he was not able to attend synagogue. And so he was unable to participate or practice in his faith the way it was demanded in Torah in the Bible, in the scriptures, so the person with this disease could not congregate with other followers and, and worship. That this, also meant, this also meant that this impacted his connectedness to God, of course, but also to people. 
He would lose out, the person with the disease would lose out on the feeding of, of his soul, right? When he would gather together in the temple courts or go to synagogue and, and enjoy the reading of the Torah and the, and the reading of the prophets. He would miss out on the exhortations of the teacher. The person with this disease would miss out on the worship with the congregation. He would miss out on the aromas of the incense, which were representative of the prayers that were offered on behalf of the people. He was unable to offer sacrifices for the atonement of his sin and for forgiveness of sin. And so much that was central to the Jewish faith was ripped away and it was made unavailable because of the condition of the person with this disease. And so by all means, for the leper, the leper in our story, he would feel helpless. He would feel alone. He would feel isolated. What can help him? What solution does a person with this debilitating disease have? And that was the condition of the man that we met and we encountered in Luke chapter 5. That is until he met a person that forever changed his life. You know, I love this next scene that I'm about to show you. I really feel that the creators of The Chosen did an amazing job at portraying this interaction. Check this out. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. It's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. Rabbi, 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 you Rabbi, cannot, it's disease, you Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. Who has an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. Green is definitely your color. Oh. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> you see, all seemed hopeless until this man met Jesus. Because number three, Jesus makes the unclean clean. As you, as you just saw in that scene based on Luke uh, chapter 5, it says this, verse 13, reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I am willing, 
be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. I want you guys to imagine the tension in this moment as Jesus reaches out his hands. No one can come close to this person. No one can touch this man. No one can interact with him. Why? Because it was just too risky. It would not only impact their physical health and well-being, but it also impacted their spiritual health. And so while Jesus reaches out his hand to this person, I would imagine the people around Jesus, any crowds that were around them, hold their breath as, as they are about to witness what is going to happen. Maybe they would warn him against touching him. Maybe they would close their eyes in disbelief in what was about to happen. Maybe making uh, ready to turn around and get away from Jesus as he would become unclean as well as he touched this man. But at this moment, Jesus risks it all. At this moment, he's a teacher. And if he touches this man, he would become ceremonially unclean. He wouldn't be able to teach or continue in his ministry. It's a big risk for Jesus. But then something amazing happens at this moment. When Jesus touches this man, his uncleanliness does not infect Jesus. Instead, Jesus' holiness makes him righteous. When Jesus reaches out to this man, Power is transferred over to the leper and Jesus makes him clean. You know, this man probably had not felt an affectionate touch from another person in a long, long time. This person that had never felt an embrace. This person that had been ignored, rejected, and outcasted. But in one moment, Jesus reaches out and he, and he touches this man. This man is able to receive the compassion of Jesus. He had not received mercy and perhaps this man had made peace with the fact that he would be stuck in the condition that he was in maybe for the rest of his life. But then in one moment, Jesus changes the trajectory of his life with one touch. And here's what I need you guys to understand. That in this story, we are the leper. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that we have a sin disease. It's a disease that is contagious that we inherited from our forefathers, from Adam and Eve. And the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. This is our leprosy, our sin nature that we inherited. Our sin makes us unclean before a perfect and righteous God. The Bible says that our sin merits death. That's what our sin deserves that we cannot enter the presence of God. We cannot even approach the throne of God. And what we deserve is eternal separation. We deserve damnation. We deserve for our sin to be dealt with by God. And as the leper was isolated, our sin merits eternal isolation from the goodness of God. We do not deserve to be in the presence of God. We deserve for our sin to be rightly dealt with. But what do we receive instead? Instead, we receive Jesus' gentle touch as God enters our messiness, as God enters our brokenness, as God enters our dirtiness, as He enters into our diseased hearts and diseased passions and sinful iniquity. God enters our brokenness. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but instead we receive mercy Jesus lives a perfect and sinless life and he dies the most wretched death on a cross and he conquers the grave. We are unclean. We are unworthy. We are dirty. We are headed for destruction and we deserve God's wrath. But when Jesus touches us, he gives us his cleanliness. We get forgiveness of sin. That's why I love what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says. I invite you guys to read it out loud with me. Ready, go. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And this is the hope that we have, and this is what we celebrate, and this is what we come together on Sunday to worship. Because we have not... We, because, not because simply because we've experienced forgiveness of sin, but because we also welcome today and receive the compassionate, merciful touch, the healing touch of Jesus. And all you need is faith in Jesus. If you're here today and you recognize your brokenness, your sin disease, and you acknowledge and you know that what you deserve is God's wrath, I just want you to know that you can experience the mercy of God. You can be welcomed into the family of God. And all you need to do is acknowledge your sin 
and trust in Jesus and He will grant you forgiveness of sin and new life. All it takes is to put your faith in Him. Guys, we are the leper. But praise God for Jesus who enters our messiness. And when He touches you, and when He touches me, our sin does not infect Him. But His holiness, His righteousness, His cleanliness affects us. And we are made righteous in God's eyes by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you chase down the lowly and the humble, the rejected and the outcast. Thank you, Jesus, that you enter our isolation and you invite us into your family. And thank you, Jesus, that you make us clean. And God, I pray for those that are far from you, would you draw them near? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.